Hey, welcome everybody to this week's uh, webinar on navigating the canine import business. Our featured speaker today is Steve Pearson from Performance Kennels. Steve is a longtime canine handler, uh, sergeant, supervisor, um, and then also runs a company, Performance Canine. Steve is, is really uh, into this topic as this is what he does. So let's work, let's all welcome Steve. And Steve, you're ready to go, go ahead. All right, thanks, Don. So I wanna talk a little bit about uh, the dilemma that we've got going on right now in, in really a worldwide dilemma in, in the, the, um, the ability or lack thereof of obtaining high quality dual purpose police dogs. And this is a problem worldwide. The supply is really in the tank and the demand is very, very high. We're gonna discuss the reasons for this a little later on. Part two of this uh, webinar um, will will cover the solutions or or the the methods and the procedures that you can use to to give yourself and your agency a leg up on on trying to solve this this dilemma. But what I've seen over the years is is that there are simply too many agencies out there who either lack subject matter experts or or are not hiring subject matter experts to select quality dual purpose green dogs for their department. As a result, these agencies are being swindled, they're being taken, they're, they're, they're thinking that they have to acquire the best that they can find without being willing to walk and, and go wait for a quality dog. They, they take dogs with, with um, uh, serious environmental or, or psychological or behavioral problems that they shouldn't obtain in the first place. Clearly it has a negative financial impact, but more importantly, it has a, a, a negative impact on the safety of the handler and the handler's uh, partners when they're handling a dog that, that simply won't engage on certain environmental, um, in certain environmental conditions and, and um, dark rooms and so on. So what I wanna do is do a little bit of the history of, of these dogs, why we import, where these dogs came from, how they came to be and so on in order to understand the, the entire picture, the, the entire industry, you have to know a little bit about the history. So we're gonna go over that just a little bit. Many of you remember the days when we used donated dogs, pound puppies, if you will, uh, they were the norm. And, and to a large extent, it worked. Um, I saw a lot of dogs come out of the pounds or, or that were donated that that really did well. I remember one out of St. Paul that, that won nationals uh, in the USPCA certification trial. So it's not that that can't work, but that pre presented some problems that, that, um, that we really, we didn't like them. I mean, we had a lot of behavioral issues. We didn't know where these dogs came from. And, um, and so we started to get away from that. Well, why did we start getting away from that? because the, the German Shepherd working lines became available in Eastern Europe. And I'm gonna go over a little bit of that, that history in just a second. So some of you grew up with imported dogs and, and, and thought that, well, that, this is the norm. It, it really is the norm today, but it wasn't the norm of, of yesterday. So um, I'm gonna go into the, in, and focus on the German Shepherd dog for simplicity's sake um, and you know, we, we could discuss, you know, Malinois, Dutch Shepherds and everything else, but we want to narrow it down to the German Shepherd um, just to keep it short. So the German Shepherd was created in a region of Germany called Alsace. And the she uh, German Shepherd dog was called by many the, the Alsatian dog. And Alsace is now part of France after World War I. Uh, the, uh, uh, the region was given back to France, where Fran France, France, of course, says it originated, and Germany stole it from them. Uh, but until 1977, many uh, of the folks in, in the UK called the German Shepherd dog the Alsatian dog, and, um, and that's what it was known as. Clearly, the, uh, uh, the Alsatian dog or the German Shepherd dog was, was initially a, a herding breed. But soon the, the Germans, the German government and others realized that, that this dog could be a working dog. And, and so they started breeding the dog as a working dog 
Um, but these working dogs began more or less in the east, um, east Germany, if you will, before they, they had unification. Uh, the dogs um, were, were bred heavily and, and quite, quite well, actually, in, in what was then Czechoslovakia. And, um, and they worked uh, for law enforcement and, and for the military. The Russians uh, also used them in their military. Um, but when the Germans lost the war, uh, they abandoned these kennels. They abandoned the kennels in the east. And, uh, you know, the wall was constructed uh, and completed by 1961. And the breeding pr program really accelerated under Soviet control. They used these dogs to keep their people in. And um, uh, they were very successful in doing that. So in 89, 90, the, the Iron Curtain came down, Soviet Union was dissolved, and conveniently the internet uh, was, uh, was completed and developed worldwide. Uh, in 93, Czechoslovakia became the Czech Republic and Republic of Slovakia. And although the government breeding program slowed, um, many in the East who were previously living under communism they soon began to understand that they could actually engage in business where they could make an obscene profit rather than to all according to their ability from all according to their needs uh, or vice versa. I feel like George Bush a little bit. Um, so the internet really helped. The Iron Curtain coming down really helped and, and importing uh, became a thing. The, the people in the West realized that, hey, Look at all these dogs in formerly Soviet Union controlled Eastern Europe. Um, wow, we want some of those. And we didn't really know they were around because they were behind the Iron Curtain. So North American breeders were, were able to breed, you know, a, a few here and a few there, but not in numbers, not the way the people in Eastern Europe were able to do. And they had those working dog bloodlines. The bloodlines in the West tended to be more specific to the, 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 the uh, specifications of the German Shepherd breed, the angulation, your stereotypical black and tan show dog, if you will, whereas the, West, the East tended to breed for the working lines, and they continue to do so. Uh, so the, uh, the high quality dogs back in the mid nineties were relatively easy to obtain and were relatively inexpensive. You could, you could fly a, a dog as excess baggage from Europe to the U S for roughly a hundred bucks. And, and you could buy them for about $1,500 or what soon became the Euro when, when the Euro uh, became a thing. So that was pretty cheap. Well, the problem is September 11th. That changed everything. Worldwide demand went up, supply of course went down. And when you have a supply and demand scheme like that, what happens to the price? It goes up, of course. So clearly there was a supply issue. The German uh, shepherd breeding folks over in Eastern Europe realized that they had to do something about this. And so they began to, to, to cross the Malinois, the Dutch shepherd with the German shepherd. And although that did help, where you take the, the stability of the shepherd and the drive of the mal, it didn't completely solve the, uh, the supply problem. So supply and demand consequences, um, you know, clearly resulted in, in, in more and more agencies being conned and tricked uh, and, and being defrauded by, by corrupt importers and exporters alike. Uh, there is a lot of fraud in this business, and everybody needs to know that. It doesn't mean that everybody in the business is corrupt, for sure. It's not true, but you have to be careful. And, and this is where a subject matter expert is going to help you when you obtain and acquire your dog. There are too many agencies out there that are accepting dogs that should be rejected or immediately returned. Um, that, is, that is super, super important. Um, the terminology, I just want to make sure that everybody understands a green dog is one that doesn't have any formal training. Yes, they all bite. Yeah, well, they all ought to. They all take a sleeve. Many take a suit and so on. 
but that's not really formal training that's building a green dog is one that doesn't have any formal training so what are the forms of deception one of them is marketing single purpose dogs who do not have the character to be a dual purpose dog as a dual purpose dog so the, you take a dog that would be super in tracking super in detection but he doesn't have the character to, to engage a man in a dark room, for example. They're being sold as dual purpose dogs because they, 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 they take more money. They're, they're, they're more valuable. Uh, that's a problem. Uh, they'll change birth dates or alter birth dates in the pet passports. Uh, old dogs become young dogs. They'll switch x-rays. I've seen that happen. And they teach inadequate dogs to pass a test. They only let you see one certain test and nothing else. And so they'll teach their dogs how to do that. A dog that has the character for single purpose is going to get somebody hurt. They're not built for that type of work. And, and you know, typically what you'll see is their, their, their lack of, of willingness to go into a dark room. Perhaps they won't go on a slick floor, uh, things like that. Another area of fraud would be the sale of dogs um, who are, are sport dogs. IPO, Schutzen is no longer, it's all IPO now, uh, KNPV, ZBV and the like. Um, these dogs may not be good candidates for police work, but that doesn't mean they wouldn't be. But you have to be careful when you test them because those dogs are worked, trained and tested on green grass. They don't, they don't do anything in a building. Many of them have never been in a building other than their kennel. They have never seen a window. They've never seen, um, you know, a slick floor and things like that. So you have to be super careful uh, when you're testing a sport dog who looks super nice on green grass in a football field, uh, but might get you hurt or killed if you depend on that dog to, to uh, help you out inside of a building. You've got to make sure that you, you emphasize environmental testing with these sport dogs. Another problem uh, that's very common with a sport dog is that they tend to be or could be uh, equip equipment uh, fixated and, uh, and they want the sleeve itself, not the man wearing it. And, and that can be a problem. That's all um, relatively easy to test for. Title dogs, they can be good candidates. I've seen it. Um, they can be, but be careful when you're testing. They're the same as sport dogs. The title dog is a sport dog who has a title. They tend to be older. Uh, IPO, I believe a minimum is 15 months for some of their very basic uh, titles. Uh, KMPV, if I'm not mistaken, is a two-year minimum. Uh, now, that's a good thing in a sense because when you're testing an older dog, what you see is what you get. When you're testing a younger dog, uh, 12 months, for example, he's still growing. In his, in his mind and his body. And you don't know necessarily where that dog is gonna stop growing. Will he be enough dog? Will he be too much dog? That again, requires a subject matter expert who has experience testing these dogs. And it's not a science, a lot of it is gut and just experience in helping you filter through that, you know, that testing of, of the young dog. That's super, super important. Uh, young dogs can, can really fool you, but like green dogs, title dogs are also in very low supply. You look at 1993, uh, almost 700 KNPV PH1 title dogs. KNPV is a strong test. It's a very strong test. And so those dogs that come out with a KNPV title are very strong dogs. Well, and they, and they tend to be males and, and duchies. The problem with that is a very strong male or duchy may not be a very good dog for a brand new young rookie handler. He may be too much dog. And, and so again, you've got to, got to be very careful in testing these, these Camp EV, in particular Camp PV dogs. Um, but you go up to nine, uh, 2019, fewer than 200 dogs are, are uh, titled in Camp EV. So even the sport dog people are having a, an extremely difficult time obtaining dogs that can pass their tests. So why would somebody market a dog uh, that has single purpose qualities as a dual purpose dog? Again, money. Dual purpose dogs bring in more money than single purpose dogs. And they don't really care if you get hurt or killed 
because your dog lacked the character to engage and, and perform as you expected them to. They don't care. They have your money. doesn't matter. So here's an example of, of one form of deception and fraud and a dilemma that the importers are, are uh, engaged with. So I'm an importer and I buy 10 dogs from Europe and I have them shipped over here as cargo. It's a little more difficult today than it used to be to ship dogs in, in numbers as excess baggage. You typically, typically can't get any more than three dogs as excess baggage. And some airlines that still take dogs and many don't anymore, it's one dog. Well, one dog is, is not a business. So most people are forced to go cargo. Cargo has become significantly more expensive today since the COVID, of course, and it can cost you upwards of $1,000 per dog because we're dealing with euros when you're purchasing from Europe. The dollar is a little bit lower today than, and the euro is a little bit stronger. You're going to pay about a grand per dog, depending on your de destination, which would include the crate. And now you're talking about real money. So I've got, I'm going to ship 10 dogs over here from Europe, pay a thousand per dogs. And then I find out that two are medically defective. I can't sell them here uh, because of the, of the, you know, the standards that my customers have. Three have environmental issues. That's not abnormal. And one is super handler aggressive. And most new handlers can't take that. Now I've got to replace these six subpar dogs and maybe six is too high. Maybe it's only four, but you get the idea. I've got to send them back. So I call my exporter and I say, hey, um, this isn't going to work. I can't keep these dogs. And my exporter says, oh, that's no problem. Um, you know, you're a good, good guy, my number one customer. Send them on back. So I do. Well, the problem is it's going to cost me about 50% more money to send them across the other way than it did to get them to come to the US. Now I've got 3,500 bucks in these six dogs and I've got to send dogs back this way. So he sends, sends me those dogs back and, and of the six new dogs, two have environmental issues. One looks like he's about five years old. He's supposed to be a year and a half. So what am I gonna do? Do I spend more money and send him back the other way only to get, uh, uh, replacement dogs that might work and might not, or do I perpetuate the lie? And perpetuating the lie is what I have to do now because I need to make money. I've got 3,500 bucks in dogs and I haven't even sold a dog yet. This is a problem. And, and this happens all the time. So you then look at what I call the Dutch business model. And this is, this is my term. And, and I got it um, through a personal experience I had when I was purchasing dogs one day. And it was just after 9-11, maybe 02, something like that. And, and the, the folks in the kennel that I was testing dogs at complained to the owner that my test was too hard. It wasn't too hard. I always changed it, though, because I knew they were going to train the dogs to pass my test. So I changed it all the time. And... It was kind of a game. They were always trying to predict what your test was. We go testing dogs, and I think I maybe picked two dogs, and I needed seven. And the, we're driving back uh, from the kennel, and, and the, ha the owner of this kennel slams his fist into the dashboard of the car and says, you are an idiot. <laughs> and I, I'm a customer. And I said, why? And he says, because all you ever do is come and take my best dogs. I was still a policeman at the time, and I, I didn't understand, well, why wouldn't I do that? And, and I asked him that, well, why would I not take the best dogs? He, said, he says, because anybody can pick a good dog. There is no profit in good dogs. The profit, the money, is in the shit. That's where you make money. You buy shit dogs, and you get these Americans to, to like them. You get them to attach to them and 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 accept the quirks that they may have. And you tell them how good that dog is and get them to believe it. And he, he was right. This, this guy was a multimillionaire. I never saw him with a leash in his hand, but he had a way of conning people and convincing people that this is a good dog, even though he wasn't. He was, he was absolute junk. But he says that the only way to make money in this business is through my model, and in two years, you'll be bankrupt. This was in 2002. 
well, I was ready to, to be done. And, and I, I can't do that. Um, ethically, I can't convince people they ought to take a dog that's going to get them hurt or killed. I, I just can't do that. And, and luckily, uh, things, things, uh, kind of fell into place. I, I found my, uh, um, my, my current place that I, that I get dogs and, and, and life is good, but it doesn't mean that it's easy. Now we got the crud, the COVID-19 and, and there are many consequences of the COVID-19, which only made this dilemma worse. Countries worldwide closed. Many states in the U.S. were, were worse than others, but everybody understands the idea of having a closed country or, or state. International travel was essentially terminated for a, for a time. It is estimated uh, by my contacts over in Europe that as many as 60 percent of the people involved in the chain of 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 uh, developing dogs from raising puppies and, and all through their life to the point where they can be sold have gone out of business or, or have gone bankrupt because their countries were closed. They couldn't get to an airport to ship a dog. And even if they could, the airplanes weren't flying. Um, well, if you can't sell dogs, why would you have puppies? And because they couldn't sell dogs and because they couldn't have puppies, what's happened to the supply now? It's, it's even lower than it was pre-COVID. And pre-COVID was horrible because of 9-11. So it's gotten even worse. Well, what's that going to do to our dilemma? It's going to result in more fraud, more swindling, and more deception. There's not a lack of dogs in this world. There are a lot of dogs in this world. There are plenty of dogs in this world, good-looking dogs, but they're not quality green, dual-purpose dogs. And that is the problem. So... These exporters, they're going to continue shipping them over here and they're going to keep unloading them. Um, and and if, if the, the importer has to perpetuate that lie in order to put food on, food on the table, they're going to do it. I just don't want, I don't want cops because I'm still part of that, that, that group. I don't want you guys to get ripped off. I don't want you guys to get hurt or killed because you think you were forced to take an in inadequate substandard dog or because you weren't smart enough to hire somebody who knew it was their do what they were doing to to sift through and navigate through that uh that selection process and detect the the fraud that uh that was going on so that's going to conclude part one i i hope i was clear in, in outlining the problem and in the second webinar we're going to discuss some of the solutions, some of the things that you can do to protect yourself and, and hopefully make your, uh, your canine program a success. So Don, back to you. Well, Steve, that was really good. Um, very, very good. Actually, a lot of information. Um, I can't wait. We can't wait till the part two comes when you tell us what, uh, what we can do about it. So uh, I wish you well, and uh, I'll see you that uh, in uh, October. Thank you. We have uh, Steve White, uh, who is going to present, and he is the still the sergeant and trainer for the Seattle Police Department. I think he's only has like about six days left. He's uh, well known. He is a speaker all over the world, and he is a trainer who trains in seminars all around the area. And so I'd like to welcome Steve in his final days as a police officer. Go ahead, Steve. <laughs> oh, man, I'm short enough that if I could jump off the edge of a dime, I'd free fall for about 10 minutes. So it's pretty good. I'm enjoying life, but um, I really enjoyed this presentation. Um, Steve Pearson really uh, is laying out the issues that we all have to address. Um, the laws of supply and demand are um, rock solid. Supply goes down, price goes up. It's that simple, you know, and if demand goes up, then price goes up, the same thing. And the demand for foreign dogs is huge. Um, I know this because uh, I've been in and out of my unit uh, through the years and I came back in 2014 and in, in between the period in, from 2007 when I left, when I came back in 2014, uh, the culture in the unit had changed. Uh, we had been an agency that had taken donor dogs from uh, the pounds, from people's backyards, and uh, had been successful. Then we started our own breeding program. 
where we at one point, every dog we had on the street was either bred by us or purchased as a puppy and raised by us. Um, and that program was marvelously successful because we got exactly what we wanted. We weren't dealing with anybody else's baggage. We weren't dealing with anybody trying to pull the wool over our eyes. The only risk you had when you have a breeding program is kennel blindness. And that's when you have somebody come in from the outside and will help you make a decision for yourself, which isn't a bad idea when you go pick a dog. I think if Steve um, conveyed one thing about here, um, this marketplace is a minefield. And uh, if you don't have a map of where the mines are, then you probably ought to bring somebody who does. Um, and uh, we purchase dogs from a particular vendor uh, who's pretty candid, who says that uh, a lot of agencies that come there, they will come with uh, a mental picture of the dog they want that consists of its breed, its gender, and its color. That's it. Give me the biggest uh, black German Shepherd you got. Give me the biggest sable German Shepherd you got. You know, um, give me the, the, you know, the biggest Malinois that you have. And it, it really does a disservice to you if you aren't temperament testing these dogs. And truly temperament testing means that you have to do some things because Steve pointed out something really important. And that is many of the European dogs, like um, in the old days, most of the European dogs that we got were sporty dogs. They were raised for a sport. And then at some point, somebody decided this dog wasn't going to be the dog that would take them to the world championships. And so they would put that dog on the market. They would go to this. And if you think about this, if you're a European and you want, and you have a kennel, you want to breed dogs and you want to be the best, breed the best dogs um, that the world has ever had. Are you going to sell your best dogs? No, you're not. Where do your second best dogs go? They're going to go to your colleagues that are close to you so you can keep your gene pool at hand for your breeding program. Everything else goes to the highest bidder. And uh, I, I think it's fair to say that American um, dog brokers have been outbid by, um, you know, the Middle East, any country hosting the FIFA World Cup or the Olympics. Uh, they, they will put a press on before those games come on so that they can go ahead and have dogs on supply to handle the big events. Because last thing they want is to be on the world stage when something goes boom that they don't want it to and and or they have a uh, civil disturbance. So um, those market forces are at play here. Um, and the European dogs that we got in those days were sport dogs that were cast offs. And, and we talked about that. And I think my job when I was looking at those dogs was always it's a good looking dog. Why did this person want to get rid of it? What is it about this dog that they said, this one isn't the one to take me there. Not that I need a dog that will win the world championships because maybe I need a dog that is maybe even um, a little, got a little more rounded edges than one of those dogs. That's fine. I don't, it doesn't matter to me. What I need is a dog that will do my job. Um, the other thing that Steve pointed out too is now that market has changed because the Eastern Europeans have found that there is money to be had in this business and they raise dogs solely for selling to the, uh, military and police marketplace. Um, and as he pointed out, very often those dogs are raised to pass a test. So the tests usually consist of, is this dog environmentally competent? What Can it go places and climb on things, get up and down stairs okay? And those are nice. They actually have a better chance of that than you did with some of the sporty dogs in the past. The other thing they're, they're tested on is, Will they hunt for a ball? Almost every video I see coming out of Europe uh, consists of a room with a bunch of furniture in it, lockers and, and cubbies and things like that. And they're busy trying to hide a ball from that dog and show you how that dog searches. And then the final test is, will that dog grab a sleeve and hold onto it? There's no question about whether they'll let go or they don't care about that. Will that dog grab a sleeve and hold onto it? And so those dogs are raised for that test. They take them places, get them comfortable with the environment. They teach them to, that immediately, the first thing you do when you get into a room is you start moving in a clockwise pattern, searching for a ball. And then finally they teach them, grab a sleeve and don't let go no matter what happens. People will test for that and they'll test for that in the vendor's environment. That's pretty good. Um, you know, when you're, you're not getting a lot of baggage that comes with training a dog for high levels of competition but you're not getting the behaviors either. So it's trade-off. And I think all of this, everything that Steve pointed out is trade-offs. 
What are you willing to give up to get what you want? And I think it's really important for you to think about these dogs as a commodity because that's the way the people are selling them to you. And you got to have a commodity that's going to work for you. So the first thing you do when you do this test, as Steve points out, is break the pattern. Get them in a different environment. Take them, do different things. Ask for the ask for the sleeve work to be on a place with a slick floor. Ask for them to take you off site and take that dog just for a walk through a local business. You know, a Home Depot. Um, you know, I've, you know the, the vendors we get to have relationships with existing business there, and we'll let you take that dog off off property. And if they don't let you take that dog off property, and it can be with their person. I, you know, if they if they want to have somebody there to watch and make sure their dogs are going to be okay, I don't have a problem with that. Um, some vendors will just let you load them up in a van and you go where you want and you do what you need to. You break them, you take them. But if you don't, they come back and that dog will be sold to somebody else. But getting them off the, off the property is, is really good because there are some vendors too that will go ahead and put the work into getting that dog ready to show to you. And the dog builds confidence on that environment. It says, in this place, I do this thing and I have fun doing it. And they're going to look really, really strong. Do that same thing someplace else. Dogs being context sensitive learners will, their performance will change. And that's what you're looking for is those subtle shifts. Um, and I don't know what the solution to this is going to be in the end. I'm waiting for part two for Steve to really lay, lay this out. Uh, but in the meantime, the only solution I know is if you're going to buy dogs, Im imported dogs, this is a caveat emptor thing. You, the buyer must beware. It's on you because he points out the cost of sending a dog back is prohibitive. So you got to make sure that you pick it right. And um, I don't mind if a vendor says to me, why are your tests so picky? Why are you so, uh, you know, why do you do so much with our dogs? You take more time than, our, than the other people doing in there. And I say, because I don't want to waste your time or ours or money sending this dog back to you, coming back to test another dog. And then taking that and having to go through this all again. So I want to make sure that this works out for us in the long run. And you should too. You should make sure that this works out for you in the long run. And if that means that um, a vendor is uh, not comfortable with you doing that, you probably want to consider another vendor. I, I mean this. You may have an existing relationship. But if they aren't willing to go through reasonable tests, then uh, you're going to have to ask yourself why. Um, and I think most vendors will. The, the, the majority of vendors will let you take that dog off site and do the work. Um, I think the other thing to think about too is that um, in, the, in, in terms of trade-offs, when you get a title dog, uh, just remember that the patterns are deeply ingrained and Steve alluded to equipment fixation. And um, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Randy Hare, who's more famous as a detector dog trainer, but he also does work with patrol dogs. And um, Randy's one of those people that um, had an influence on me. Oh, maybe 15, 20 years ago, we, we, we stuck, uh, struck a relationship. And uh, the one thing I think he looks for that I agree with more than anything else and has shifted my thoughts, I don't look for a dog that really is crazy to want to possess the ball. I want the dog to feel that that ball or that tug is a vehicle for a relationship with you, a, a vehicle for activity with you, that that ball... Is something to bring back to you and say, hey, are we going to play some more? And it's either going to drop it at your feet and want you to throw it again, or it's going to want you to grab that rope and play tug with it, or it's going to want you to take that tug and grab a hold of that and play tug with it. A lot of these dogs are built to want to possess instead. And you're going to have to bring that back out of them. That being said, I found that the most, most of the dogs we've had, it takes a couple of months but you can get a dog that is equipment oriented and fixated on the on the piece of equipment and get them to shift to the game. Once you get them to shift to the game instead of the object, you can also get them to shift to the person instead of the instead of the equipment, instead of the sleeve, instead of the suit, instead of the muscle. So, um, but it takes work and you have to calculate that into your training costs. I'm lucky that I work for an agency that lets us have a longer academy than most. Um, but um, you're going to have to convince your administrators that that's what you need to get it done um, because the market is only going to get thinner. The demand is going to go up and um, we're going to have to, we're going to have slimmer pickings uh, moving forward, I think, for a while. Uh, I don't know when that will change. 
And I don't think the United States has the institutional or um, institutional will or the dog sport culture to breed enough dogs to meet U.S. needs. And I would say Canada is probably in the same boat. And that's why imports are still um, most people's go to. I don't really have anything else to add to Steve's presentation, except that I like on the edge of my seat waiting for part two, because I want to hear um, the rest of this and, and how he how he approaches it. Um, so I'm going to pass the ball back on to anybody else that wants to chip in. Thanks, Steve. I appreciate the uh, the report uh, and the thoughts that you have over the years of selecting dogs and how many days are left. Uh, well, October 15th is my last day. Yeah. Uh -huh. And how many days are you going to work in between then? One? Uh, <laughs> I have a, I have a few days. Okay. Days work. I'm done. Um, next, we have uh, John Kerwick, who is, um, was the manager of the largest uh, police canine uh, group in the state of New York and possibly the largest MTA group of bomb detection dogs in the United States. Um, he was the, uh, the leader of that unit for many, many years, and he retired just recently, and he has uh, offered himself up to a, a lot of things for uh, dog-related stuff, and this is one of them. John, go ahead. Hi, everybody. Uh, John Kerwick here. Can you hear me? Good. Yes. So thanks to Steve and Steve for your presentations. I always learn a lot from you, Steve White, and really good luck on your future. You're going to have a good time, trust me. And uh, and Steve uh, that gave the first presentation that was very worthwhile. And I, I'm looking forward to number two. You know, when I got up this morning, I said I'm just going to sit in here for a minute and uh, maybe make a quick uh, comment or two. And then I started thinking about it, and my mind ran all over the place because I have a lot to add to it, but it's not well organized. So I will do my best. You know, I just retired from an agency where we purchased anywhere between 15 and 30 dogs a year, depending upon how many dogs we were replacing in the unit and how many outside agencies we were training. And we usually made it a, almost, I wouldn't say a requirement, but we made it uh, something we wanted, we would prefer to have happen that we would be involved in the purchasing of any dogs and testing of any dogs uh, that we were gonna train for an outside agency. But, um, We've had really good vendors, really bad vendors. Um, and I think the, the, the thing I found is it pays to start preparing to purchase a dog way before you need them. Uh, how many times does a boss tell you, hey, you can replace these three guys in your unit, but you have to do it next month. That's not the time to start thinking about trying to find a vendor, trying to get a contract and trying to purchase these dogs. That happens much too quick, and that's when you will just take what somebody throws at you because you're careless. So police work is not uh, defined well, and it's a very dynamic thing, and we have issues. A lot of times we have to rush through things. I get it. But if you have all your work done in time, you'll have a much smoother purchasing uh, time here. Um, one of the things that I usually recommend somebody who's going to do this is to start talking to other agencies, talk to other trainers, see who they're using for a vendor and what kind of uh, product they're getting from that vendor. Talk, you know who's reliable and who's not to deal with. And, and that's what I try to do, deal with the people that are producing uh, good street dogs, uh, whether they be detection or patrol, and uh, see who they're using. Now, the next step after that, uh, after you limit down a few vendors, um, and I recommend having more than one vendor available to you because depending upon world events can change, the dollar can change, prices can change, all these things when you have in a contract, um, your vendor may just not work. He may not have dogs, uh, supply and demand. So I, I truly recommend to always have two or three vendors on contract that you feel comfortable with. If you have to do a school with more than one dog and you need more than one dog, um, you may have to test quite a few dogs to get a suitable candidate. Um, before you do anything, I recommend calling up the vendors and tell them what you expect. Before you enter into a procurement with them, 
before you're actually willing to go test the dog, have a conversation. They, they want your business, most of these people. And if they don't, well, you're learning from experience and you wouldn't know that until you got there. Having, uh, having your own procurement department decide who your vendors are gonna be is not the way to go purchasing this kind of item. They, in purchasing, they may be able to decide who to buy the cheapest clocks from, but they should not have anything to do with the decision on choosing your vendors other than ethics. Um, if you have a civil conversation with these vendors and tell them what you expect, explain your testing process to them. Tell them how long it's going to take you to do that. Tell them what kind of tests you're going to do with the dogs. Tell them what you expect the dogs to do. They'll have a, a better idea of what you're looking for. It probably presents you with that kind of animal when it comes time to test. You want to discuss things like a health guarantee. You know, before it gets into the contract, hey, what happens if this dog develops cancer in six months? What do I have? And then who's responsible for the cost of that dog going back? You know, you may say in your own world that, oh, he'll have to pay for it, but he's going to, the wrong vendor is not going to do that. And he's going to say it's your responsibility. And you're going to have to stick your tail between your legs and you're going to have to figure it out. Um, I really think most problems can be rectified in advance if we talk with the vendors and tell them what we expect. And uh, as far as vendors go, and I'm talking general here also, Steve, um, the shorter time, unlike regular business, the shorter time that a dog vendor is in business, I feel he is more honest and he's more reliable and he's more stable. And I, as a, as a uh, purchaser, will get a better candidate out of him. The longer a dog vendor stays in business, and this isn't everyone, they seem to tend to do what you said, Steve, perpetuate that lie. And a guy who was good this year, next year or the year after, may be a total mess. So your research and your vendors and, and your things have to be current because things can change so quickly. And a guy, we had a vendor who literally would drive a dog to our training facility if we even hinted we didn't like what we had and come with five dogs to test the next morning and he had a 10 hour drive. And today he, he would just shrug his shoulders and go, well, okay, bring him back to me. And even though the contract would be worded that he was responsible, um, vendors know that they're needed. Um, how do I put this without, without being negative? Um, sometimes we're our own worst enemies. So we get a dog, we test the dog on site and we do a good valid test, but dogs are dogs. And sometimes mid school, a dog washes out for whatever reason, environmental usually. And, uh, we have to return the dog and we have to give a good explanation to the vendor. He's entitled to know exactly why. But you have to have talked about this in advance. Like, what's his responsibility to get you another animal? How's that animal getting back? Who's paying for that? Because in, in our world, that happened to us three to four times a year, at least. Out of 20 dogs, we would probably end up mid-school losing three to four dogs out, out of that, out of 20 per year. Um, so it may not be like that for you. You may get lucky with one dog or two dogs. and, and God bless you for that. But I think these are things that need to be discussed so that you don't have to deal with it when you're at a disadvantage and that school is at week eight and you have eight weeks left and you know you're going to have to start this guy out all over again and time is of the essence. You need to have this stuff done well in advance. Um, health guarantees are, have to be discussed. The radiographs on the dog, the, the x-rays, where are they coming from? Are they coming from Europe or are they coming from his vet? Are you allowed to have your vet call his vet and discuss those things? There's a lot here to do. And that will tell you the integrity of the vendor also. Um, personally, we always did our own radiographs after we got the dogs. And, and that's because uh, not all vendors are like this, but some vendors have burned us in the past. So we've had some very good vendors with radiographs and some very bad ones where they didn't even match the dog. Um, but... Testing is a whole other issue in my world. Uh, testing is a very intricate, important part of the purchase. 
but I'm just going, it's kind of going over the background on the things that can happen when you actually own this dog and the bad things that can happen as a result of that. So besides vendors, the AKC has a program called the AKC Detection Dog Task Force. And I'm going to probably talk more about that in Steve's second seminar. But I will tell you this in, in short things. Long term, right now with the way the dollar is, the way COVID is, Europe is affected, I don't know that our standard import way of doing business is the best for us. I don't have the absolute solution to fix it in a heartbeat. Um, but I do think that possibly we actually have to start thinking about getting dogs from the USA uh, and starting to do some breeding here within the States or gleaming from people other than Europe. Because every time there's a world event, uh, right after 9-11, right after anything that happened after London, the price of the dogs went up overnight. The availability became almost impossible to get. And it really went to who would ever pay the highest price. And if you have a standing contract, uh, your procurement people aren't going to want to hear that. They're just not going to agree with it. Um, I've had people, I've had a vendor come and show us a dog that we liked and said, I have to take him back to the, to the uh, kennel for whatever reason. I'll bring it back to you tomorrow. And then get a phone call three hours later from the canine unit down the street telling me they just bought the dog I just passed on because my contract said 6500 and they were willing to pay 7500 And that's the kind of un unreliability, unethical stuff that can happen in the dog world. Uh, people who sell used cars, there's some really good people and there's some really unethical people. And the fact of life is in the dog world, there are used dog salesmen. And we have to be wary of that. And the best way you can avoid that is A, have a procurement process that works with contracts that actually are workable. You actually have to go as far as to find the word dog. It took me six months to write our contracts, the testing process, who made the decisions. And that way there was no legal retribution back for the vendor to uh, say that we, we didn't test the dog good enough, it's our fault. Um, we were successful, but it took time, it took effort. I um, want to close with this. There's some really good dog vendors out there. I'm not here to bash dog vendors. There's some very, very good people out there that are very trustworthy. And I, again, I'll go back to the shorter period of time they're in business, the more reliable they are. And that's just my opinion. Um, but long term, the system is broken. Uh, imports, in, in my opinion, in my experience, is a great product, but it's not sustainable right now. And I think anybody who's in this business that had saw COVID issues, see the market drying up, see the dollar dropping, all these things are going to cause nothing but issues for us getting dogs. So looking at it from 10,000 feet and wanting to be able to buy dogs tomorrow and five years from now and 10 years from now, my opinion is we have to start putting some effort into looking into raising and breeding some local dogs. And, and I'm not that expert in that. There are other people who are. But I, I've worked with uh, the AKC a little bit about it and talked about it. I don't know how much. I'm not here to say that they have the program worked out. I don't think they do. But I think the idea is, is worth exploring. And I think it's our future uh, rather than dealing with all this uh, that we're dealing with now. And, and that's all I have, and I will be quiet. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, next, we have Dr. David Ferlin, better known as Lou. He uh -huh. has been everything in law enforcement from a patrolman all the way to the chief of police in Portsmouth. He was a trainer, or he is a trainer. He's an expert witness. He is teaching criminal justice uh, in, the, in college at this time. Uh, Lou? All right, so thanks, Don. Thanks, Steve, uh, both Steves. Uh, John, for your insight here, and uh, of course, the USPCA. And I want to wish the USPCA good luck in two weeks. I know you all have in your national field dog trial, so good luck with that, gang. Uh, listen, I'm honored to be part of this group. There's no doubt about that. Uh, over the summer, or actually beginning in the spring, um, that this group has brought some very important topics to uh, not just our members, but uh, in canine uh, industry in general. 
And um, I can't get over already just in what, an hour, 50 minutes, how much terrific information has been relayed on uh, selecting dogs, importing dogs, and some of the uh, issues that, that go around that. You know, I remember importing dogs, uh, Steve was talking about it, importing dogs for excess baggage fees between 50 and 100 bucks. And, you know, and that was the days over in Germany and in Europe where it seemed like every family, instead of going bowling like we did over here, was going out to a Schutzenfield or wherever to try to train that grand national dog. And when that dog, the first sign that that dog was not going to make it, let's say it didn't have the right coloring or confirmation uh, to pass the next levels, uh, it could be that simple. Uh, they would try to sell the dogs, and the biggest market at the time was the U.S., and we could buy pretty cheap dogs and really good dogs at really cheap prices. So I remember those days, and then all of a sudden 9-11 hit, and you're right, uh, things got a little bit uh, crazy with the demand on the dogs. But anyway, one of the nice things about going later in a presentation is that you get to talk a little bit about the takeaways and you don't have many more add-ons because someone ahead of you has, has done that. But let me talk about some of the uh, takeaways that I have uh, in my experience and also during this presentation. And one is, you know, departments are getting sold just too much dog for what they need. You know, I'm over here in New Hampshire. It's generally smaller agencies that are getting dogs. Uh, they're mostly search needs for these dogs, and they're getting uh, Porsche's uh, biting dogs um, in exchange for all the money that they're spending for their dog. They're getting a pretty highly trained apprehension dog when really what they need to have is uh, an unbelievable search and rescue dog because most of what they're going to be doing is searching woods for bad guys, lost runaways, lost Alzheimer's patients, and things like that. So the vendor is kind of selling them into buying just simply too much dog. Then the other thing is, you know, uh, it, 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 there's power in buying multiple dogs. You know, when you have a police academy, police dog academy, you know, that's 15 dogs deep, 20 dogs deep, you're running a class every eight weeks or so, and you need hundreds of dogs over the course of the next couple of years, you have some power in that purchase. And so the smaller agencies generally get dogs that have been already presented to another agency that probably could spend more money on a dog, but has rejected that dog. And of course, you're not being told this information that a dog has been, you know, uh, tested by another agency and then rejected. And yeah, so you need to ask that type, those type of questions, you know, has this dog been presented to other agencies? And why is it that that other agency did not pick the dog? Now, that doesn't mean that the dog won't be suitable for you. You know, take a dog, for example, that, you know, doesn't like slippery floors or something like that and wouldn't make for a good prison environment dog, but perhaps is going to make a wonderful search and rescue dog that's going to be searching out in the woods or in the swamps. So it does, just because a dog has rejected, just because a department has rejected a dog doesn't necessarily mean it's not the right dog for your department. And then, you know, I don't know why we got away from looking for domestic dogs or looking for those shelter dogs, but I remember going to shelters looking for the dogs and we found some pretty good darn dogs there. Now, of course, they're not matching the power and the capabilities of some of these Malinois and things of that nature, but we did find some pretty good darn dogs at the, the shelters. And, you know, I think we need to revisit our whole domestic um, industry of dog uh, breeding and things of that nature. And, you know, the whole mantra of buy USA, I think we should be looking a little more closely at USA. And if AKC or some other organization is able to develop a credible screening tool uh, for law enforcement or for the, this type of industry to, to be able to evaluate dogs or at least screen pre-screen the dogs ahead of time, uh, that would be a valuable uh, resource to have. And then I can't underscore enough, I heard the car dealer, you know, I, I, I know car dealers have this negative connotation to them and I don't want to apply it to all dog vendors, but really buying a dog is like buying a used car. You know, the more gadgets you get in a car, the more money you're going to sp spend. The more, the more training that you get in a dog, the more money you're going to spend. And, you know, there's car dealers out there that will, you know, put the, what is it, sugar or whatever in a transmission to make it work better for the short term. You know, and there are vendors out there who are going to falsify an x-ray or even sell a dog that is not the paperwork that you're looking at. 
it's just a completely different dog. It doesn't match the chip. It doesn't match the, the, the tattooed number or whatever. It just doesn't match the dog. And they're just simply selling you uh, a fraud. And uh, that was already pretty wildly covered. So that's one of my takeaways and one of my add-ons is, you know, there's just a whole lot of fraud out there. And I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, the smaller agencies versus the larger agencies. And you have to know your place and you got to know um, that you need to find a mentor. You need to find somebody qualified who is experienced at selecting dogs. And I always find one of the most interesting things I like to do is when I go to a police dog field trial, or one of those trials that involves either high-level sporting dogs or high-level police dogs, you know, I always try to find, hey, who was the vendor that sold this department that dog? Who also is their training? Where, where are they training? You know, because I want to know who is the hot hand. Who is the one that is selling the quality right now? Who's the one that's serious about building an empire or building a business that is going to make a name for themselves in training and selling quality dogs. Not the not necessarily a vendor who had that track record, who is now just kind of retired in place and looking just to make some money. But actually, who is the one that has that desire? Who's the one that is bringing the ethics into the business that really wants to transform the dog world into producing some really terrific dogs and putting them in places you know, that is going to make a difference. So, you know, I'm hopefully next time we'll talk a little bit more about green dogs and trained dogs. And, you know, maybe we'll get more into the health records and the x-rays and things like that and the chipping. Maybe we'll get a little bit about, you know, the sports dog testing. Because I remember testing a dog that when we brought the dog into the woods, it wouldn't go into the woods. It was just so used to the Schutzen field that the dog had never, ever seen five feet inside of a wood line. All it did was want to pee on the first tree it saw, and then it stayed in the grass area. And I'm not kidding you. We almost literally had to pull the dog into the wood line to get the dog to come into the woods. Now, it was a finely trained dog, but only for, you know, two and a half, four inch grass uh, was the limitation. So anyway, listen, thank, gang, I want, to, I want to thank you for allowing me to have a little part of this. And I'm thoroughly enjoying it, and I'm looking forward to the next presenter. Don, I pass it off to you, sir. Thanks, Lou. I appreciate it. Next, we have a longtime um, promoter of police canines. His name is Gene Ramirez. He is the founding member of Manning, Cast, Elroyd, Ramirez, and Truster. He is um, everything in canine, especially for us. So, Gene, go ahead. Well, I think I should just shut up after that intro and just call it a day. So uh, good morning, everyone, or afternoon, depending where you are. And Steve Pearson, thank you very much. Uh, all the comments have been great. I'm going to be really quick. I think uh, handler selection is important, but sometimes more important, of course, is canine selection. And I've done a lot of reviews or audits of canine units over the last couple of years. And what we're seeing a huge problem is the purchase and evaluation of the dog and whether it's a good fit for that particular handler or that's the only dog left so he's going to get it or she's going to get it no matter what and that that, and that kind of scares me because it's not going to be a good fit but more importantly in looking at where you purchase your dog is what type of training is going to be provided are they law enforcement qualified to be training your handlers in tactics and how to search and use of force because that dog is a use of force and a lot of people i think sometimes sell their dog as being reasonable force because it's guard and bark so therefore it's going to be less liability than a so-called find and bite dog and i disagree and i tell everybody i don't care if you're find and bite guard and bark or sit and piss uh it's either a good bite or it's not under graham versus connor while we still have graham versus connor so don't get swayed that, oh, we sell only guard and bark dogs, so your liability is going to be lower. And sometimes that's not always true. If your trainer is not law enforcement qualified, maybe they're a great sports dog trainer, and that's great, but make sure you bring someone either in-house or retain an outside consultant to come in and train your canines on proper canine tactics. We're seeing many cases where 
they're going to a uh, outside uh, private vendor. They're getting uh, whatever weeks that they get for their training. And they think they're good to go on the street as soon as they get their little certificate. And we find out later they're not really ready to go. And they really don't know how to put that dog into a law enforcement environment. So get someone in there that's going to be able to train them properly. One of the things that I was just reading that someone sent to me is uh, there was a verdict that came out. I'm trying to figure out the date. It was a... Uh, July 29th of this year, so a little over a month ago, and it was a verdict in a wrongful death case caused by a retired police dog, and the verdict was a result of someone dying as a result of being bitten by that retired police dog and another person being seriously injured. The verdict was $20,800,000. $20,800,000. For wrongful death, serious injury caused by a retired police dog. And I'm not going to get into all the facts, but as we're talking about purchasing dogs, let's also be cognizant of the issues that involve retiring a dog and when you let the handler keep it or you sell it to somewhere else. Uh, because this case seemed to deal with a canine handler from one agency in Northern California who left that agency to join another police department in Central California. And he had had a dog for about several months. He was supposed to get 400 hours of training. He only got 200 hours of training for a variety of reasons. And then he retires his dog, and then he tries to convince his new police department to let him have his dog as a police dog, and they should start a canine unit. Well, that never happened. In the meantime, one day, his personal German Shepherd and his retired police depart, uh, dog get out of a gate and they attack a postman, chase him into his vehicle, and then attacks his elderly couple, uh, causing a woman to fall to the ground, hitting her head, causing serious injuries. An older man who came to a rescue was bitten severely in the arm. Uh, he eventually dies three days later as a result of the dog bite. The plaintiffs, the injured family's attorney argued and the jurors obviously agreed, was that the city that originally had the police dog and then sold it to this retired officer was negligent and failing to one, warn that this officer, that he, had, that he was an officer with limited training and experience, that in retirement, a patrol canine can never be untrained, that they failed to warn him that the retired canine can never become a pet, that for the rest of the retired canine's life, he or she must be kept locked in a kennel and not let out except when the officer under the officer or the owner's direct control. So now it looks like we have to uh, re-examine our liability releases or when you retire a dog and add this additional language. And uh, Don, I'll be doing a further uh, article for uh, the USPCA Canine Courier, kind of going over what I'm talking about because I think it's something that we should be aware of. We cannot prevent any dog from biting many times, especially a retired dog. Uh, but this tells us we need to be on notice and let our retired handlers who are gonna keep their dog, put them on further notice what can happen in order to reduce the liability of that agency. So those are some of the things that are going on out there. I hope you find that helpful. Like I said, I will do a more full memo on this case as I find out more information I will get it out as quickly as I can. Those are my thoughts for the day. Thanks, Gene. I appreciate it. And to all the speakers, thank you. Um, as you uh, probably have already heard, we're going to have a part two on this. And I think what we were doing here was giving you a description of a part one and what are the problems. Part two is going to be some uh, information on how we can get a remedy this situation. And as John Kerwick uh, brought up, uh, talked about the AKC uh, starting something out uh, with the uh, detector dog program. Uh, so we will be, that will also be brought up uh, as I've been talking to them myself. Um, but for now, I think we are, we're just going to leave it go. Um, I don't think there are any questions. Um, no. No question. So we will get a hold of everyone in our normal, the normal way and invite you back for part two. We do appreciate um, everything that uh, 
that the speakers have uh, put forth, and especially to Steve Pearson. Thank you all.